What up everybody? This is the Negative Maps YouTube page and we are going to be continuing our reading on Bergsonism by Gil Deleuze and we're picking it up on the second rule, struggle against illusion, rediscover the true differences in kind or articulations of the real. The second rule. Bergsonian dualisms are famous. Duration, space, quality, quantity, heterogeneous, homogeneous, continuous, discontinuous, the two multiplicities, memory, manner, re recollection, perception, contraction, relaxation, detente, instinct, intelligence, the two sources, etc. Even the running heads of Bergson's puts at the top of each page of his books indicate his taste for dualisms, which do not, however, have the last word in his philosophy. What, therefore, do they mean? According to Bergson, a composite must always be divided according to its natural articulations, that is, into elements which differ in kind. Intuition as method is a method of division, platonic in aspiration, inspiration, sorry. Bergson is aware that things are mixed together in reality. In fact, experience itself offers us nothing but composites. But this is not where the difficulty lies. For example, we make time into a representation imbued with space. The awkward thing is that we no longer know how to distinguish in that representation the two component elements which differ in kind, the two pure presences of duration and extensity. We mix extensity with duration so thoroughly that we can now only expose their mixture to a principle that is assumed to be both non-spatial and non-temporal. And in relation to which space and time, duration and extensity are now only deteriorations. To take another example, we mix recollection with perception, but we do not know how to recognize what goes back to the perception and what goes back to the recollection. We no longer distinguish the two pure presences of matter and memory in representation, and we no longer see anything but differences in degree between perception recollections and recollection perceptions. In short, we measure the mixtures with a unit that is itself impure and already mixed. We have lost the ground of composites. The obsession with the pure in Bergson goes back to this re restoration of differences in kind. Only that which differences in kind can be said to be pure, but only tendencies differ in kind. The composite must therefore be divided according to qualitative and qualified tendencies, that is, according to the way in which it combines duration and extensity as they are defined as movements, directions, and movements. Sorry, directions of movements, hence duration, contraction, matter, expansion, detente. Again, there is some resemblances between intuition as method of division and transcendental analysis. If the composite represents the fact, it must be divided into tendencies or into pure presences that must only exist in principle. We only, sorry, we go beyond experience toward the conditions of experience, but these are not in the Kantian matter the conditions of all possible experience. They are the conditions of real experience. This is the Bergsonian leitmotif. People have seen only differences in degree where there are differences in kind. And Bergson groups his major critiques, which make difference in, sorry, which make different forms under this heading. His fundamental criticism of metaphysics is that it sees differences in degree between a spatialized time and an eternity which it assumes to be primary time as deterioration, relaxation, or demutation of being. All beings are defined on a scale of intensity between the two extremes of perfection and nothingness, but he directs a similar criticism of science. 
There is no definition of mechanism other than that which involves a spatialized time according to which beings no longer present anything but differences of degree, of position, of dimension, of proportion. There is even mechanism in evolutionism to the extent that it postulates in a unilinear evolution and takes us from one living organization to another by simply by simple intermediaries, transitions, and variations of degree. The whole source of the false problems and the delusions that overwhelm us lie in this disregard for true differences in kind. As early as the first chapter of Matter and Memory, Bergson shows how the forgetting of differences in kind, on the one hand between perceptions and affection, on the other hand between perception and recollection, gives rise to all kinds of false problems by making us think that our perception in extensive in character, sorry, um, by making us think that our perception is ex inextensive in character. There are in the idea that we project outside ourselves states which are purely internal, so many misconceptions, so many lame answers to badly stated questions. Okay. I was just going to say, I think what we're saying is the, the articulation between differences in degree versus differences in kind. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which can be shorthanded to differences in quality to differences in quantity, which is probably the easiest way to turn those terms into something that we actually use in practice. Quality defines the very nature of a thing, um, the very nature of a measure of a thing, whereas the quantity is the amount of that very nature. Um, and this is very, we see this in the beginning of difference and repetition. He's setting up difference and repetition really well here, where he talks about the difference between what you can call general equivalence and repetition, and why general equivalence isn't the same as repetition, because a repetition has to be in both quality and quantity, whereas general equivalences can be of the same quality, mm -hmm. but can differ in quantity. Or they're in this, they're the same in kind. Um, but what's the other term? <laughs> differences in kind, differences in form and degree. Yeah, but they're not necessarily differences. So we're getting a lot of, oh, we're getting so much here already. And then there's this. Uh, everything is a composite. Fantastic. Uh, this is another way of him later on saying everything is a multiplicity, which he will get for, which will get for desire, which will be the foundation of anti-Oedipus. Desire is a multiplicity. It's a composite. It's made up of several elements. It's not just one thing. And this is the foundation of so many illusions, so many false problems that we think something is one singular thing. It's not. It's multiple things. And not only is it multiple things, but these multiple things are different in kind. They're of different qualities, and we mistake them to be of the same um, quality. And as he says here at the beginning, at the top of that page, um, about pure presences that only exist in principle, we go beyond experience toward the conditions of experience, but these are not in the Kantian matter, the conditions of all possible experience. So all these problems that we're talking about, when we're talking about, we're doing a, a genealogy, right? In order to talk about a problem, you must talk about where the problem comes from, the conditions in which the problem arises, the language which we use to describe the problem. We don't want to talk about every every single metaphysical possibility. That's that's the Kantian system summed up. You need to use this transcendental logic to define how all experience is possible, you know, via the categories, via intuition and space and multiplicity and all the rest. We are using Bergson, Deleuze is using Bergson here far more empirically, or in a way that, that seems to be avoided by Deleuze phenomenologically. We don't want to talk about possible experience. Not that there's something wrong with that, you know, as we'll get later on, you know, problems between the more and the less. Don't mistake the more for the less. Um, the possible has just as much as the real, but the real also has just as much as the possible. Um, that we want to talk about the conditions of real experience. That, that metaphysics here, our metaphysics, the transcendental empiricism only functions by discussing the conditions of stuff that we can <laughs> say to actually experience. And this is a bit of a Spinozan turnout of Kant too. Sorry, it's a lot of it's a lot of names and a lot of a mumble jumble. Though. I hope that um, I hope that does a little something <laughs> in trying to bring it back to the Deleuzian system overall. What this text does, I mean, it's fantastic. I love books. This this book is loaded, absolutely loaded with stuff. 
So we have the creative discovery and then apprehension components we got to look for here, where the first rule was much more with the stating of the problem or creation of the problem and navigating away from the non-existent problems, which was the confusion with the more and less, and then the badly stated problems, which that was kind of the uh, badly analyzed composites, <laughs> which was kind of a Kantian business. We almost tried to say the non-existent problems or the mistaking of the more and the less or real and possible, which is kind mm. of what he talked about already in this last thing we just read. Uh, we kind of almost said that was uh, a, a kick at Hegel's dialectical method and some sort of negation. Bergson's non-existent problem seems almost a critique of the negations. But again, both of those types, non-existent problems, which was confusing the more and the less, and badly stated problems, which was confusing badly analyzed composites, comprise the false problems. So we need to be aware of these false problems when we attempt to create or state a problem. So when we state a problem correctly, it has in it the solution. That's what we're trying to get at. So mm -hmm. in the second rule, once we've, we've already kind of passed from that stating of the problem, now what we're attempting is a discovery of uh, genuine differences of kind. So... Deleuze saves us from the platonic discovery by first we create the problem and then we discover the genuine differences of kind in that kind of created problem that we have uh, got into. And, and again, to, to then we can go into the third stage of an apprehension of real time where we're going to use our temporality uh, fun things. But so th those three comprise of the intuition as method. So... Mm -hmm. That last bit is just so much of the classic differences in kind, differences in degree, trying to delineate the two. We have extensity, movements in space, intensity, and therefore duration, movements, you know, and affects in time. Trying to delineate these, again, is what Bergson's great at, uh, what is kind of said there. Bergson finds a duality, and he, he kind of screams Eureka. <laughs> <laughs> He know, he has his his intuition as method is you know Bergsonism knows how to skewer dualities. There are no dualities with Deleuze using Bergson and Spinoza. There's you know uh, we are we are saved. Um, so uh, just to kind of reorient us in the sense of where we're going, it seems where, where Deleuze is trying to orient us uh, here. Um, and the two sources business is a, is a call at Bergson's last text, Two Sources of Morality, which again, uh, Two Sources of Morality and Religion, which is to say that static religion is that which bases its methods on nature, whereas dynamic religion or process theology is that which bases its methods on intuition. That's what we're trying to get at. In intuition, we have good process philosophy and therefore good process theology. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. So dope. Yes, thanks. It's fantastic. Um, so I, um, I say one little brief thing. Sorry, I'll try and keep it as, as little as possible. And then should we continue with the quote? Cool. Continue with the page. Um, I thought so. The, yeah, the intuition is method, and then later on we'll get into duration, which is already we're already seeing it come up here. In differences of kind, durations already come up in the next chapter. We'll get into that a little bit more. How intuition is directly knowing one's duration. Um. And this idea of the false problem. Um, so was, we've just got this, I can't find the quote exactly, but it's basically pretty much just said that the only thing which we can describe as pure is not the things themselves, but the differences between the things, which we're now calling the differences in kind. These are the pure differences. Um, intuition then as realizing false problems is not a finger that points and says, that's a false problem. That's a pure false problem because right. there is no yeah, false problem. We are realizing that within this false problem is a composite, a composition, and there will be elements of the false problem which we can label um, as false um, because it doesn't recognize this, doesn't recognize that. But that means that we are also recognizing in the false problem the elements which we want to 
take further and develop, which is the same thing that later on Deleuze Guattari will say in, in what is philosophy, that um, philosophy as such is one, the concept of creation, but two, it isn't what you call defending the vanished concept, which is exactly what it means to say, to point the finger and go, ah, oh, false problem, false problem, you know, this isn't a real, this is a pseudo problem, you know, you're not actually doing any real philosophy, you're just making stuff up. Um, to defend the vanished concept without giving it the forces it needs to return to life, say the losing Batari, these people who do that, who just vanish and point the finger, they are the plague of philosophy. <laughs> Intuition as such as a method. Must, if it's going to point the finger, it also has to, it has to point the finger at itself as well. <laughs> it has to turn Absolutely. The finger around. Absolutely. Reminds me of my grandma, and... what my grandma would say is, um, you point one finger and you have four fingers pointing back at you. Or... <laughs> <laughs> but that's absolutely it. That's intuition as a method I'm subjectively summed up, I think, precisely. One finger out, four fingers returning. These four fingers returning are, well, they've got the, the, the one finger that defends the vanished concept. Away with it. Destroy it. I hate this concept. It's a bad concept. But all the fingers that come back are going, well, actually, let, let's let's expand upon this co concept more. Let's talk about what, what elements actually make up this composite that we're calling a, a concept. Let's actually look into what's good and what's bad. I mean, we get this in Nietzsche, right? We get this in Spinoza. We are seeing Deleuze using all of the intuitions and all of the methods that he's picked up so far in his earlier texts. And he's now using Bergson as a kind of conduit for all of those thinkers at once. It's truly insane. <laughs> it's incredible what a system what a metaphysics oh Dope. i'm happy you guys happy yeah hey, let's ready ready let's keep it rolling no text shows more clearly than the first chapter of matter and memory how complex the manipulation of intuition is as a method of division the representation has to be divided into the elements that condition it into pure presences or tendencies that differ in kind how does Bergson proceed? He asks first between what two things there may be or may not be a difference in kind. His first response is that since the brain is an image among other things or ensures certain movements among other movements, there cannot be a difference in kind between the faculty of the brain, which is said to be perceptive and the reflexive function of the core. Thus, the brain does not manufacture representations, but only complicates the relationship between a received movement, excitation, and an executed movement, response. Sorry, executed movement. Between the two, it establishes an internal, whether it divides up the received movement infinitely or prolongs it in a plurality of possible reactions. Even if recollections take advantage of this in interval, or strictly speaking, interpolate themselves, nothing changes. We can, for the moment, uh, discount them as being involved in another line. On the line that we are tracing, we only have, we can only have matter and movement, movement which is more or less complicated, more or less delayed. The whole question is knowing whether in this way we have already have perceptions by virtue of the cerebral interval in effect a being can retain from a material object and the actions ensuing from it only the elements that interest him so that perception is not the object plus something but the object minus something minus everything that does not interest us. It could be said that the object itself merges with the pure virtual perception at the same time as our real perception merges with the object from which it has abstracted only that which did not interest us. Hence, Bergson's famous thesis, the full consequences of which we, have, sorry, we will have to analyze. The thesis is this. We perceive things... Where they are, perceptions put us at once into matter, is impersonal, and coincides with the perceived object. Continuing on this same line, 
The whole of Bergson's method consists, first of all, in seeking the terms between which there could not be a difference in kind, there could not be differences in kind, but only differences in degree, between the faculty of the brain and the faculties of the core, between the perceptions of matter and matter itself. We are now in a position to trace out the second line, which, difference, which differs in kind from the first. In order to establish the first, we need fictions. We assumed that the body was like a pure mathematical point in space, a pure instant or a succession of instants in time, but these fictions were not simply hypotheses. They consisted in pushing beyond experience a direction drawn from experience itself. It is only in this way that we can extract a whole aspect of the conditions of experience. All that is left now is to ask ourselves what fills up the cerebral interval, what takes advantage of it to become embodied. Bergson's response is threefold. First, there is affectivity, which assumes that the body is something other than a mathematical point and which gives it volume in space. Next, it is the recollections of memory that link the instances to each other and interpolate the past in the present. Finally, it is memory again in another form, in the form of a contraction of matter that makes the quality appear. It is therefore memory that makes the body something other than instantaneous and gives it a duration in time. We are consequently in a presence of a new line, that of subjectivity, on which affectivity, recollection, memory, and contraction memory are ranged. These terms may be said to differ in kind from those of the preceding line, perception, object, matter. In short, representation in general is divided into two directions that differ in kind, into p two pure presences that do not allow themselves to be represented. That of perception, which puts us at once into matter, and that of memory, which puts us at once into the mind. Once again, the question is not whether the two lines meet and mix together. This mixture of a, is our sorry. This mixture is our experience itself, our representation. But all our false problems derive from the fact that we do not know how to go beyond experience towards the conditions of experience toward the articulations of the real, and rediscover what differs in kind in the composites that are given to us and on which we live. These two acts, perception and recollection, always inter interpenetrate each other, are always exchanging something of their substance at, by a process of endosmosis. <laughs> the proper office of psychologists would be to disassociate them, to give back to each its natural purity. In this way, many difficulties raised by psychology and perhaps also by metaphysics must be lessened. But they will have to, sorry, but they will have it that these mixed states compounded in unequal proportion of pure perception and pure recollection are simple. And so we are condemned to an ignorance alike of pure recollection and of pure perception, to knowing only a single kind of phenomena that will be called now recollection and now perception, according to the predominance in it of one or other of the two aspects. And consequently, um, to finding between perception and recollection only differences in degree and not in kind. Okay. Um, should I keep going? Any comments? Uh, yeah, we can do some comments. I got some notes from that that were really good. I like the... Uh, so, it's beautiful. I'm in the middle. I literally was just reading the first chapter of the matter on matter and uh, memory... Uh, like an hour ago, <laughs> uh, so I can I could elaborate on the images, but honestly, Deleuze really gets you, gets you where where you need to be. I mean, 
Bergson says, in lack of all philosophies, if we're just to take a common sense, layman, phenomenological, concrete experience approach, we are in the presence of images, three images in particular of interest, the image of the universe, the image of our brain, and the image of our body. Now, those all have very particular different qualities to them that are of great interest to Bergson um, <laughs> and of great interest to anybody who is involved with perception. Now, to move on to that, the next great point is what he says here in the text. Perception is equal to the object minus the, the desire or the interest of it. You know, now that's exactly right. That's that's Husserl. That's Heidegger. That's that's a great mm -hmm. phenomenological point right there. Um, Bergson, the phenomenologist, you know, uh, in perception, we have two things, double fold nature, right? The object itself merges with a pure virtual perception that, you know, is of our doing, but also at the same time, our real perception merges with the object from which has been abstracted only that which did not interest us. How mm -hmm curious that's a fascinating statement that i think really turns phenomenology on its head i mean bergson it's it should be husserl heidegger bergson um i think anyways uh <laughs> so jack uh, and then, i have a question based on that yeah. really quick so um it, is bergson basically saying that our intuition as method already basically separates the two components two composites or the two components which comprise a composite um, kind of naturally without even needing to use our intellect would that would that be accurate or am i on the wrong yes yeah it's uh so again and uh what's really curious if i could elaborate on that just a little bit further to bring in a little bit of matter and memory there is and it is this is plotinus this is really bergson's use of plotinus here so let's play a game we have a universe we have an image that is a universe and we have an image of a person let's say now this person comprises of two images let's just call it a brain and a body the brain is where the motor functions are operating now there's this other thing called a body now that body is actually a very curious image it's different than any image or that we are in the presence of it is the house of conscious perception of executive movement now what that means and i will just put one more sentence out there and, and we'll, we'll stop bergson gives us a very fascinating thought experiment he says what happens if we take the body the brain place it in a universe three images and you cut the body from the brain with a scalpel yikes kind of scary right what you would then have is a floating brain essentially with no conscious perception what we perceive through the body actually come to find out says bergson is half started executed movements they're half made actions that our brain then kind of decides hey let's focus on that it interests me let's act that out and it's further now there's a deeper buddhist point we can make there but i'll end that now that again is all in Hausen chapter one of matter memory in this very amazing meditation on images and our presence the presence of images all around us um yeah so <laughs> and then uh to take to touch on one more thing with this chapter uh, or this little part we just read so he then goes on to say uh this like three this three part process now this is uh deleuze's kantian uh use of Burks and you know syntheses in, in action how he says affectivity that which you know gives a, a volume in space body is something that is quantitative i would say with whitehead that is the body is which we first receive as intensity it is not quality it's not qualitative it's still quantitative but it is intensity quantitative deleuze would say now that moves us into the second stage recollections of memory that is a fun game we play where we cancel extensity, not intensity. The first stage was canceling intensity. The second was canceling extensity, where we interpolate the past and the present. 
how curious again though we are still playing quantitative games this allows us to go into our third movement which would be a movement and a different kind of memory this would allow us to uh essentially it's a contraction of matter that allows us to cancel out the quality of the thing and get at some form of a qualitative idea the first and last movement into the qualitative and this is Deleuze's Kantian syntheses with Bergson. Um, and again, at the core of this, what we're doing that's different from, let's say, Kant, intuition as a method presupposes duration. So it allows us to, again, the third movement at the end of this whole thing, this third rule we're going to go into after this chapter, will be the apprehension of real time. That's what we're really doing. It's the Kant's two days, Descartes, right? Cons to extensity. We need to not only bring intensity as far as Spinoza is concerned to allow us our ontology of eminence, but we need uh, memory. <laughs> it's not just matter, and you know, we need memory which allows us our quality that Deleuze, Deleuze is trying to get at here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, those, are, those are some of the notes just from that last little part. Dope. Um, shall we keep going? Are you ready? Cool. Are y'all cool if I yeah. keep reading? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yes, please. Intuition leads us back. Sorry. Intuition leads us to go beyond the state of experience towards the conditions of experience. But these conditions are neither general nor abstract. They are no broader than the disconditioned. Than the conditioned. They are the conditions of real experience. Bergson speaks of going to seek experience at its source, or rather, above that decisive turn, where, taking a bias in the direction of our utility, it becomes properly human experience. Above the turn is precisely the point at which we finally discover differences in kind, but there are so many difficulties in trying to reach this focal point that the acts of intuition, which are apparently contradictory, have to be multiplied. Bergson thus sometimes speaks of a movement that is exactly appropriate to the experience, sometimes a broadening out, sometimes a tightening and narrowing. For in this first place, the determination... Um, the, ter the determination of each line involves a sort of contradiction in which apparently diverse facts are grouped according to their natural affinities, drawn together according to their articulations, but, on the other hand, we push each line beyond the turn to the point where it goes beyond our own experience, an extraordinary broadening that forces us to think a pure perception identical to the whole of matter, a pure memory identical to the totality of the past. It is in this sense that Bergson on several occasions compares the approach of philosophy to the procedure of infinitesimal calculus. When we have benefited an experience from a little light, which shows us a line of articulation, all that remains is the ex is to extend it beyond experience, just as mathematicians reconstitute with the infinity, infinitely small elements that they perceive of the real curve, the curve itself stretching out into the darkness behind them. In any case, Bergson is not one of those philosophers who ascribes a properly human wisdom and equilibrium to philosophy to open us up to the inhuman and the superhuman durations which are inferior or superior to our own to go beyond the human condition. This is the meaning of philosophy insofar as our conditions condemn us to live amongst badly analyzed composites and to be badly analyzed composites ourselves. But this broadening out or even this going beyond does not consist in going beyond experience towards concepts. For concepts only define in the Kantian manner, 
the conditions of all possible experience in general. Hence, on the other hand, it is a case of real experience in all its peculiarities. And if we must broaden it, or even go beyond it, this is only in order to find the articulations on which these peculiarities depend, so that the conditions of experience are less determined in concepts than in pure percepts. And while these percepts themselves are united in a concept, it is a concept molded on the same on the thing itself, which only suits that thing, and which, in this sense, is no broader than what it must account for. For when we have followed each of the lines beyond the turn in experience, we must also rediscover the point at which they intersect again, where the directions cross and where the tendencies that differ in kind link together again to give rise to the thing as we know it. It might be thought that nothing is easier and that the experience itself has already given us this point, but it is not as simple as that. After we have followed the lines of divergence beyond the turn, these lines must intersect again, not at the point from which we started, but rather at a virtual point, at a virtual image of the point of departure, which is itself located beyond the turn of experience, and which finally gives us the sufficient reason of a thing, the sufficient reason of the composite, the sufficient reason of the point of departure, so that the expression beyond the decisive term has two meanings. First, it denotes the moment when the lines setting from an uncertain common ground give in experience diverge increasingly according to differences in kind. Then it denotes another moment when the lines converge again to give us this time the virtual image of the distinct reason of the common point. Turn and return. Dualism is therefore only a moment which must lead to the reformation of a monism or Spinozism. This is why after the broadening out, a final narrowing follows just as integration also follows differentiation. We have alluded elsewhere to those lines of fact, each one indicating both the directions of truth because it does not go far enough. Truth itself, however, will be reached if two of them can be prolonged to the point where they can interact. In our opinion, this method of intersection is the only one that can bring about a decisive advance in metaphysics. There are therefore two successive turns, two successive turns in experience as it were, both in reverse direction. They constitute what Bergson calls precision in philosophy. Okay, so maybe a few points and then we can go on to the complementary rule. The Deleuzian metaphysics done quickly, Jesus. <laughs> Phenomenology? Phenomenology? No, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't fail to lose. <laughs> You're right that we are seeing phenomenology in practice. We are seeing phenomenology at work. Why? Because phenomenology simply means how to deal with Kant. That's all that that means. But phenomenology itself means dealing with Kant through Hegel. And thus, if you want to do that, you wouldn't need to read Bergsonism. You could just read the phenomenology of the science and then move on to Herschel and Heidegger and so on and so on. That's not what Deleuze does. It's not what Deleuze wants to do, which is why we're reading Bergson, which is me, which means that, yes, we still want to deal with the Kantian problems. We still want to look at the root of Kant's problem, and that is what we call pure reason, the problem of the pure, which is only an excitation of Kant in response to Hume, because Hume is the one that tells us that we cannot deduce factually these pure genetic points of departure. They, we cannot reach these, these pure, whatever you want to call them, intensities, these pure differences in kind, because they are the very conditions for our experience themselves. But nevertheless, through real experience, we can talk about them because we develop what he calls habit. And out of this habit, which is perfect right now for, for uh, matter and memory, is nothing but a condensation of what Hume calls habit. 
out of this habit, out of this real experience that we have, we can use what, what Nisha calls genealogy. We can trace all of our real experiences back to their points of departure, where we find there are other points of departure too, of objects, of events, of other subjects. Matter and memory. So these are two differences in kind. Does this, does this not <laughs> make you... I mean, there was a Freudian slip. Did someone say Spinozism instead of monism? <laughs> Because this is this is true. This is right. Matter and memory. Don't you mean thought and extension? Um, Spinoza is the one who shows us here, for instance, the paradoxical element of intuition, which is that we have an infinite one substance, a singular substance in which all things come to collapse in on. And at the same time, on that very plane of immanence that we call the one, the infinite, there exist differences in kind. There exist expressions which are unique, although they are expressions of the same thing. There is four, which is different from extension. And, but then these come to have the modes um, and the... Uh, what's the other one? Um... Uh, as modes in another word, that means basically how, how thought and extension themselves break down from qualities into, into secondary qualities and then these qualities into quantities and so on and so on. And this is, uh, <laughs> this is how we deal with Kant. I mean, we're seeing lots of new terms, Brooksonian terms, but all along the way you have to be reminded of things like um, the plane of imminence, things like... Um, all the terms that D and G come to create for themselves out of these texts, after these texts, to deal with the problems outright. All of all of Deleuze Guattari's concepts are the result of intuition as such, are the result of taking taking these philosophies at heart, of trying to deal with Kant outright, trying to look at the pure genetic points of, of departure for the conditions of experience. But rather than going through it phenomenologically, that is to say, through Hegel, through Hessel Heidegger, we simply want to look somewhere else. We want to look through Hume. What did Hume say? Blah, blah, blah. What did Spinoza say? Blah, blah, blah. And what did Nietzsche say? And what did Marx say? And so on and so on. Um, oh, God. Um, <laughs> sorry, I hope that makes some sense, at least. Um, we're still dealing with Kant. Kind of... This my main point. <laughs> But not phenomenologically. We want to do something else, which we then, which we come to call transcendental empiricism, right? Which means we still have the hallmark of the problems of purity. Um, uh, the best way that I can put it is, as Mao says it in, a, in a contradiction, if intuition as a method can be represented through Mao, it would be exactly what he says when he says, through the particular, to the universal, back to the particular. And that's where I'll end. <laughs> We are no longer looking at transcendental categories, which are reached through um, our intellect, right? We are looking at a transcendental field, which matter and memory interact on. And it's not just concepts themselves that interact, but the genesis of real experience on a transcendental field. So this is why fiction is really important, right? We, our genesis of legitimate beliefs comes from an interplay of sometimes fictitious things and ways that associations occur, right? So I think what Bergson is trying to get at is like, well, how can we separate like what might be a more... Um, true belief that doesn't mix up differences in degree versus differences in kind, right? And it, it's through that method of intuition that we can really start to um, engage with the genesis of experience on the transcendental field, um, yeah. right? So, and whenever we, whenever we can do that, we can look at these composites, which are just multiplicities, in other words, right? There, it's one thing that's made up of many other things. Um, and we can look at these composites and not just see a homogeneous mass. We're, we're not looking at a melting pot of just kind of stew. We can start to separate the potatoes from the carrots, from the broth, and from the noodles or whatever else kind of veggies we have in our stew, right? Um, and and that is how we can kind of separate that those differences in kind, right? Is from our intuition, which is a 
process of our body as opposed to merely our intellect, right? So we're moving away from intellect or or um, trying to deduce transcendentally through the categories like what is um, a true belief or what is um, kind of a moral or ethical belief. Um, that's that's my bit. I like that's it. Beautiful. I like it a lot. Yeah, experience is due. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry, Jeff. Can I jump, can I jump into the, the next reading? Yeah, you're, you're welcome to start. Hell yeah, okay. <laughs> the particular... Okay. Hence, a complementary rule to the second rule. And again, the second rule, discovery of genuine differences in kind, um, seeing through the illusions... Th this co the complementary rule to that the real is not only that which is cut out according to natural articulations or differences in kind it is also that which intersects again along paths converging toward the same ideal or virtual point the virtual Deleuze is using that from Bergson we want to actualize the virtual not realize the possible <laughs> The particular function of this rule is to show how a problem, when it is properly stated, tends to be solved of its own accord. That's a restatement of the first rule, in a, in a, in a sense. For example, still in the first chapter of Matter and Memory, the problem of memory is correctly stated. Since starting from the perception recollection composite, we divide this composite into two divergent and expanded directions, which correspond to a true difference in kind between soul and body, spirit and matter. But we can only reach the solution to the problem by narrowing. When we attain the original point at which the two divergent directions converge again, the precise point at which recollection inserts itself into perception the virtual point, that is, like the reflection and the reason of the departure point. Thus, the problem of soul and body, of matter and spirit, is only solved by an extreme narrowing in which Bergson shows how the lines of objectivity and of subjectivity, the lines of external observation and of internal experience, must converge at the end of their different processes all the way to the case of aphasia. Aphasia. Cody, can you help me? Aphasia? Think, oh, no, I need I the end there for this. <laughs> I think that's a psychological term for loss of memory. Yes. Or oh, brain um, damage or something. Loss of articulation. It means mm. you, you can no longer... You can use words, but they no longer mean anything. So you'll start okay. to go sheepdoll 42. And for you, you might think you're expressing something, but the, the mind and the way that it works won't actually be able to turn that into an articulatable speech. I believe that's our page. Yeah, that's, that's exactly that. right. That's exactly right. Again, the, the reason that's a huge point brought up again and again in Matter and Memory from Bergson. I mean, that's a huge thing because if I could say just one more thing and then I'll jump back into this last paragraph. <laughs> what Bergson is doing with aphasia, it's very important. Bergson is trying to bring metaphysics out into the open. If we can find metaphysics in the brain and then bring that into some sort of psychological experiment that we can expose through the mm -hmm. real, wow, mm -hmm. that's some knowledge. Okay. Um, Bergson yes. yeah. shows similarly that the problem of the immortality of the soul, Plotinus, tends to be solved by the convergence of two very different lines. That of an experience of memory and that of a quite different mystical experience, um, like William James, <laughs> another friend of Bergson. The problems that are unraveled at the point at which three lines of facts converge are even more complex, such as the nature of consciousness in the first chapter of Mind Energy. That's another text of Bergson's. It should be noted that this method of intersection forms a genuine probabilism. Probabilism. <laughs> Each 
line defines a probability. That sounds a little like quantum mechanics. Yikes. But it is a qualitative probabilism. Lines of fact being qualitatively distinct in their divergence in the disarticulation of the real that they brought about according to the differences in kind, they already constituted a superior empiricism capable of stating problems and of going beyond experience toward concrete conditions in their convergence and in the intersection of the real to which they proceed. They now define a superior probabilism one capable of solving problems on the plane of eminence and of bringing the condition back to the conditioned so that no distance remains between them. And that's another big point in chapter one of matter and memory. We're trying to find bodies on the plane of em eminence such that we can mm -hmm. measure a distance with precision. That is not a measurement in space. That is a measurement in intensity <laughs> of longitude of latitude of space mm -hmm. and time Deleuze mm -hmm. finds us on a Spinozan plane of eminence and Always. Bergson helps us articulate it absolutely articulate it further Spinoza only went so far he stops at act two he stops at thought and extension Bergson goes no 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 keep going <laughs> you can keep dividing and you can keep finding differences in kind in order to get to the to not just stop at God or infinite, or substance. That's that's such a badly worded situation. What, the thing that we all emanate from is just nature? No, 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 keep going. There are planes. There are all sorts of things going on within this thing we call nature. And it goes far beyond just the two problems. There's always a third problem that we can speak of. Oh, man. So Third body problem. Uh, we're really close to finishing up this chapter. Could, could we continue this chapter and then close off with any, like, kind of discussion, perhaps? Let's do cool. it. Um, Let's go. I'll do. Uh, can I do a little bit more of the third you're, rule, you're, and then I'm gonna pass it off to Cody or something. It's up to you. If you want to finish it off, that's fine. If Cody wants yeah, to read, that's fine. Jack. I don't really care. I'll do a I'll little bit more. After. More than I'll pass it off to you, Cody. Mm -hmm. Third rule: state problems and solve them in terms of time rather than of space. This is the Bergsonian turn. This rule gives the fundamental meaning of intuition. Intuition presupposes duration. It consists in thinking in terms of duration. That's how we escape nature, the problem of changing nature. We can only understand it by returning to the movement of the division, determining the differences in kind. At first sight, it would seem that a difference in kind is established between two things or rather, between two tendencies. This is true, but only superficially. Let us consider the principle, Bergsonian division, that between duration and space. All the other divisions, all the other dualisms involve it, derive it, or result in it. Now, we cannot simply confine ourselves to affirming a difference in kind between duration and space. The division occurs between duration which tends for its part to take on or bear all the differences in kind because it is endowed with the power of qualitatively varying with itself and space which never presents anything but differences of degree since it is a quantitative homogene homogeneity there is thus not a difference in kind between the two halves of the division the qualitative difference is entirely on one side. When we divide something up according to its natural articulations, as with proportions and figures that vary greatly from case to case, we have, on the one hand, the aspect of space, by which the thing can only ever differ in degree from other things and from itself, augmentation, diminution, <laughs> and on the other hand, the aspect of duration by which the thing differs in kind from all others and from itself through alteration. Take a lump of sugar. It has a spatial configuration, but if we approach it from that angle, all we will ever grasp are differences in degree between that sugar and any other thing. But it also has a duration. 
a rhythm of duration, uh, a dance of life, a way of being in time that is at least partially revealed in the process of its dissolving. And that shows how this sugar differs in kind not only from other things, but first and foremost from itself. This alteration, which is one with the essence or the substance of a thing, is what we grasp when we conceive of it in terms of duration. In this respect, Bergson's famous formulation, I must wait until the sugar dissolves, has a still broader meaning that is given to it by its context. It signifies that my own duration, such as I live in it, the impatience of waiting, for example, serves to reveal other durations that beat to other rhythms that differ in kind from mine. Duration is always the nomadic location and the environment of differences in kind. It is even their totality and multiplicity. There are no differences in kind except in duration. While space is nothing other than the location, the environment, the totality of differences in degree. All right, Cody, all you. I got I got some notes to, to jump into. Um, Sorry, for I, wanted that. In. I wanted to develop on that point so much. Sorry, so in degree. Perhaps we now have the means to resolve the most general of methodological questions. When Plato formulated his method of division, he too intended to divide a composite into two halves or along several lines. But the whole problem lay in knowing how to choose the right half. Why was what we were looking for on one side rather than on the other? Division could therefore be criticized for not being a genuine method since it lacked a middle term or dialectical point or whatever and still depended on inspiration. In Bergsonism, the difficulty seems to disappear, for by dividing the composite according to two tendencies, with only one showing the way in which a thing varies qualitatively in time, Bergson effectively gives himself the means of choosing the right side in each case, that of the essence. In short, intuition has become method, or rather, method has been reconciled with the immediate. Intuition is not duration itself. Intuition is rather the movement by which we emerge from our own duration, by which we make use of our own duration to affirm and immediately to recognize the existence of other durations above or below us. Only the method of which we are speaking allows one to pass beyond idealism as well as realism to affirm the existence of objects both inferior and superior to us, though nevertheless, in a certain sense, interior to us. One perceives any number of durations, n durations, all very different from one another. In fact, the words inferior and superior should not mislead us, they denote differences in kind. Without intuition as method, duration would remain a simple psychological experience, however. Conversely, if it did not coincide with duration, intuition would not be capable of carrying out the program that corresponds to the preceding rules. The determination of true problems or of genuine differences in kind. Let us return, therefore, to the illusion of false problems. Where does it come from and in what sense is it inevitable? Bergson calls into question the order of needs, of actions, and of society that predisposes us to retain only what interests us in things, the order of intelligence in its natural affinity with space, and the order of general ideas that tend to obscure the differences in kind. Spooks. <laughs> or rather, there are very varied general ideas that themselves differ in kind, some referring to objective resemblances in living bodies, others to objective identities in inanimate bodies, and others again to subjective demands in manufactured objects. But we are quick to form a general idea of all general ideas, 
and to dissolve differences in kind in this element of generality, general equivalence. We make differences in kind melt into the homogeneity of the space which subtends them, the stew. It is true that this collection of reasons is still psychological and inseparable from our own condition, imminent. We must take into consideration more profound reasons. For while the idea of a homogeneous space implies a sort of artifice or symbol separating us from reality, it is nevertheless the case that matter and extensity are realities, themselves prefiguring the order of space. Although it is illusion, space is not merely grounded in our nature, but in the nature of things. Matter is effectively then the aspect by which things tend to present to each other and to us only differences in degree. Experience give us composites, stews. Now the state of the composite does not consist only in uniting elements that differ in kind, but in uniting them in conditions such that these constituent differences in kind cannot be grasped in it. In short, there is a point of view, a door of perception, or rather a state of things in which differences in kind can no longer appear. And this is Monet's for you. The retrograde, retrograde, sorry, as in backwards, movement of the true is not merely an illusion about the true, but belongs to the true itself. That's duration, baby. Bergson adds dividing the composite religion into two directions. Thank you for this, Jack. Static and dynamic religion. That in placing ourselves at a certain standpoint, we should perceive a series of transitions and, as it were, differences of degree, whereas really there is a radical difference in kind. The illusion, therefore, does not result only from our nature, but from the world in which we live from the side of being that manifests itself to us in the first place. Bergson evolved, in a certain sense, from the beginning to the end of his work. The two major aspects of his evolution are the following. Duration seemed to him to be less and less reducible to a psychological experience, Einstein's relativity for you, and became instead the variable essence of things, providing the theme of a complex ontology. But simultaneously, space seemed to him to be less and less reducible to a fiction, separating us from this psychological reality. Rather, it was itself grounded in being and expressed one of its two slopes, one of its two directions, matter and memory, for an extension. The absolute, said Bergson, has two sides or aspects, spirit imbued with metaphysics and matter known by science. But the point is that science is not a relative knowledge, a symbolic discipline that commends itself only by its successes or its effectiveness. Science is a part of ontology. It is one of ontology's two halves. The absolute is difference, but difference has two facets differences in degree and differences in kind. It can therefore be seen that when we grasp simple differences in degree between things, when science itself invites us to see the world in this way, we are again in an absolute, with modern physics more and more clearly revealing to us differences in number behind our distinctions of quality. It is, however, an illusion but it is only an illusion to the extent that we project the real landscape of the first slope onto the other. If the illusion can be repressed, it is because of that other slope, that of duration, which gives us differences in kind corresponding in the final instance to differences of proportion as they appear in space and already in matter and extension. Oh, the tiny last little bit, the conclusion. Thus, intuition does form a method with its three or five rules. There is, and this is an essentially problematizing method, a critique of false problems and the invention of genuine ones, differentiating or carvings out and intersections, temporalizing, thinking in terms of duration, 
But how does intuition presuppose duration? And how, on the other hand, does it give duration a new extension from the point of view of being and knowledge? This is what remains to be determined. Boom. What I love about um, the history of philosophy to lose is that he's a very professor-like writer in the sense that at the end, he's like, I'm going to tell you exactly what the organiza- what my outline was and which points I made, and there should be no ambiguity of what the main points of this chapter were. Love that about that, about his early work in particular. All of his solo works come from the seminars, which weren't, you know, very much like uh, the professor has the whiteboard and he teaches you stuff and you question every now and again. But it was very much, um, they wanted it to be like a laboratory, you know, an experiment where Deleuze has his points, his questions, his problems, and he would show these to pretty much the world and they would come to him and they would offer to them their own perspectives to which he would find ones that suited once that worked, once that didn't work. And only after like 10, 15, 20 of these ongoing seminars would he condense down everything into a short book. Yeah. So this is only like 100 pages, but it was fucking hours and hours worth of discussion and work. It's fantastic. Right. I think that you were totally seeing the, the monism of Deleuze and Bergson, which is really just Spinoza in, um, or is actually Deleuze which would be just a trench coat with Spinoza, Bergson, Nietzsche, (laughs) all just creating this monster. And I I think what make, where you you really see this monism, at least in this last section that we just read, was when, because Deleuze doesn't simply subordinate um, the mind to the body or the body to the mind. And he also doesn't subordinate differences in degree to differences in kind or um, matter to memory, right. Or intellect to intuition. Um, Mm. The, the whole point I think of that last, especially those last few pages was that like um, a real empiricism would be one that doesn't look at just one half. It's, he says it's about choosing the right side, but you also have to like know how both, sides of the multiplicity are important right one side is a false side and um this isn't to say so when you read a dualism the best the most famous one we can think of is descartes it's not that oh mind is the right side and body's the false one or body's the right side and mind is the false one the side we're talking about is what then we'll find later on in, in the, what is grounding is the third term always which comes out of one of these when you collapse one side in on the other what happens when you collapse mind in onto the body now you've formed a new plane a new plane by which you can experience mind and body as differences in kind but they are no longer completely inseparable from one another but they are also at the same time like sugar which dissolves of their own duration Mm -hmm. and differ to themselves not all mind is the same mind it's in a constant flow not all body is the same body it's in a constant flow and you escape all dualisms like this and this is how we're saying this is how philosophy works it goes hand in hand with science science which shows us things <laughs> and philosophy which tells us to reject what it is that we're seeing as such but to take it much further to compare what you're seeing to what other available perspectives have for you and this is how we ground ontology as such not by going well i've seen this and that's just the science i've seen this i've observed this this is how it is but to actually locate through genealogy the points of departure the lines of articulation why it appears in that way in that point in time why it appears to us in our experience of duration in that form why do mountains look to us like mountains um, when they themselves are different and changing they're in a movement themselves a movement of growth and development and sedimentation but we don't experience a mountain like that as a thing which collapses and grows and forms we experience that only in terms of our own duration and this is why duration is the philosophical concept you need to extract genesis to extract ontology out of science beautiful beautiful shit thank you Dylan. so thank you bergson so duration in my understanding could be understood as the totality of what makes up the time of a thing 
I don't know if that's the correct way of looking at it, and I would love to hear your kind of perspective. So here's why I think that. Um, with mm. the sugar example, the idea of like um, the duration of the sugar in the coffee or the tea or whatever, right, is it's um, it's it's total totality of the time of when it's still sugar and not dissolved into the coffee. I think I might either be completely on the right track there or completely missing the yeah. point. So I'm I'm okay either way. I just want to – I'm curious what yeah, your yeah. thoughts are. Anyway, this gets developed in the next – in one of the chapters that has called One or Several Durations. <laughs> <laughs> but what does he say? He says that Bergson says, I must wait for the sugar to dissolve. It's not that the sugar is an essence which itself dissolves as a thing in itself. It's a sugar is an experience of my own duration. It's not just the sugar's duration, it's my duration of the sugar too. It doesn't just dissolve in itself. I have to wait. My patience and perspective directly takes part in the dissolving of the sugar. This is why you have to bring back hexaity and longitude and latitude to all. You know, these objects aren't separate from their subjects. Perceptions aren't separate of matter. Memory isn't separate of matter. These things are involved in each other always, all the time. End durations. I think he wants to say at the same time, um, there is one, there is one duration, the infinite potentiality of duration itself as we know it, and there are the unique expressions of duration within it. And these durations, like all lines of flight, interact on different planes, intersect and carve one another out. Some durations explicitly result in the destruction of other durations. I mean, this whole thing is just, it's crazy. So it's not just a psychological experience. It's not just I experience sugar dissolving. Mm -hmm. It's that there is a material reality to sugar dissolving that I, as a subject, am also experiencing through perception. And we cannot neglect that this is just, it's not just, this is just what's happening. We also have to try and talk about what else is happening. But at the same time, admit that we cannot go further than perception but we can use perception in a very paradoxical way to become aware of other perceptible possibilities. Yeah. To po the perceptions which then these to us are fictions because we don't experience them through perception, but we make them up in perception. But that doesn't mean that they're not real. They are just fictions that can point us to other doors of perceptibility. Like how does Huxley try to tell us about? It's like Hume. The belief is, is constituted by reliable fictions, right? It's, it's yes, it's it's not that like there are um fictions and non-fictions it's that there's <laughs> only fictions that are constituted by our like maybe you could say psychological unconscious processes which are the result of like real the real movement of things right um however we that doesn't mean that all fictions are the same <laughs> yes absolutely exactly what i wanted to say if everything is a fiction then we then have to also say but not all fictions are the same some are illusory some are bad fictions some are boring and we want to collapse all fiction in on each other we want to say and like he's told us in in um, practical philosophy in spinoza that like we are experiencing threefold illusions and consciousness is one of them the illusion of self the illusion of mind and the illusion of consciousness it doesn't mean that they're not happening it just means that these appear to us as concrete as whole images and when we do that we reject the very possibility for their difference we reject the very difference in kind between these things we reject dur the duration of these things how these things collapse in on one another and at the same time express themselves uniquely yeah i'm it's a lot going on <laughs> i'm reminded of like the old philosophical question of um if a tree falls in the woods would you hear it or it, oh, does yeah. it still fall or whatever oh, yes. right um i think bergson's answer is interesting right because um yes the tree has its own duration and so does the person perceiving the tree who has their own duration of the tree which also has its own duration so yes it does make a sound of its own duration but it also matters when we are there to perceive it or not right and Weird yeah. flatlining of the question almost entirely skirts the question, but it's, I think, almost a more satisfying answer than just saying, like, nah, it doesn't make a sound because we weren't there to hear it. Absolutely. It's like, well, certainly. There's two there, planes now. There's an intensity it's not just the reverberating. Plane. Sorry. There's also the virtual plane. Right. Even if someone isn't there, it doesn't mean that virtually there can't be subjects present. It doesn't mean that you can't use fiction to imagine a world in which you are there. 
And that doesn't mean that things change. It just means that something is added in conjunctive synthesis and so on and so on. Right. So we're getting to about um, an hour and 15 minutes of a recording, and that's certainly pretty long. Uh, let's leave this moment for any closing comments. I know Jack probably might have something they want to say. So, Jack, do you want to – Jack and Cody, yeah, Jack so... and Cody perhaps. <laughs> um, so to use your tree example, what Bergson would say is we need to find ourselves somewhere in between Berkeley – of the British empiricist camp and Descartes of the continental rationalist camp. If the tree makes a sound, Spinoza answers that question for us. It really becomes, is that tree, which is a body near the body of the other body that would perceive it. So it becomes a question of distance on that plane of eminence. That's what Bergson's trying to point us to the duration of the tree and the duration of the other entity, therefore their own durations can almost uh, complement each other. It's kind of like the Spinozan parallelism though. It's, it's like an artificial relationship yet they can still kind of communicate. Now the dissolving of the sugar example, again, is that uh, state change of a qualitative uh, direction and then a kind of energy loss or a heat radiation in a quantitative kind of way that again spinoza uh, latitude longitude mm -hmm. bodies on a plate of eminence that is what intuition as a method helps us kind of navigate now again we are trying to make maps on these planes of eminence but the map is not the territory so these fictions these signs these pointings yada 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 the buddha when he says or when he points at the moon do not mistake his finger for the moon. Don't go to the restaurant and eat the menu, <laughs> which is the representative knowledge of the food. Eat the food. Intuition as method allows us to utilize our own simple intuition to navigate these kind of uh, uncertain waters. What kind of uncertain waters? The waters that the scientists have given us. Science talks in absolute differences in degree. Bergson and Deleuze wants to indicate to us that there is another type, which is differences in kind. Now, that is a kind of metaphysics where, you know, Bergson talks about where a, the spirit is imbued with metaphysics or that of memory, which is different fundamentally than, you know, the science that kind of talks about matter, you know, uh, known by science or it can be measured by science through extension, right? So in ten, in intensities and affect differences in kind in that sense or qualitative need to be fundamentally differed from quantitative. Mm -hmm. That is fundamentally the difference in duration that we're getting at because duration is a difference in kind of a qualitative multiplicity. It is unextended. It is heterogeneous. Space, which is what the scientists concern themselves with are is a difference in degree the power of a quantitative homogene homogeneity a quantitative multiplicity that is extended we need to utilize Kant's three syntheses to get at qualities from quantitative multiplicities and that is what intuition as a method kind of helps guide us with is essentially we're just writing you know the Kant human side of the history of philosophy using Bergson and Spinoza and Deleuze. <laughs> oh yeah. Let me uh let me see if I can try and Bergsonism that the problem. This, this, this the whole thing about this is that we're using intuition as a philosophy that determines true problems. So uh if a tree falls, does anybody hear it? Badly stated problem. Why? Because you're talking in terms of space and not in terms of time. Right. How do you do that? How do you then how do you then talk about the duration of a tree and the duration of a sound and the duration of experience? How do you do that? So simple. Here's how you use intuition to do that. Here's what Deleuze tells us. It's not a case of a tree. Because why? A body is not the organs that fulfills it, nor the function it performs, but the series of relations on the levels of longitude and latitude. What does that mean? How do we express this as a good problem then? Well, you'd have to say it in terms of verbs. That's how duration works instead of space. Space is a noun. 
Space is a tree because a tree is somewhere. Duration is a treeing, which means the movements and relations that produce what we can call the hexaity of the tree. A treeing, falling, <laughs> sounding. That's how we state the problem as a problem in terms of time and duration rather than in terms of space. And that's what we have to do for everything. This is how we use process philosophy and the language of, of difference to state problems as they should be. Not a case of where does it fall? What is a tree as a determined static thing somewhere in space? Mm -hmm. It's it's the tree is itself movement. And these movements are themselves movements in relations to other movements. And we can only do that by expressing verbs, movements, and duration instead of points in space, beings in space. This is how you collapse ontology onto ethics. And it's Spinoza who really does help us get out of this, as much as all the other philosophers too. They help us word it better. They help us escape Kant in wording things better. Not in terms of essences, but in terms of movements and relations and difference. Something that the hexaity is just a masterful term, an absolutely beautiful term, which reminds us this constantly of several durations at once. There is no things. There are only the durations of things. And these durations are themselves n and several. God, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I, think, yeah, I think it totally makes sense. And in terms of speed and slowness, and this will be my final point, and then we could end the recording. Mm -hmm. In terms of speed and slowness, right, this seems really, might seem kind of confusing, right, to say, like, we look at this tree, it doesn't look like it's moving at all. It is complete, it mm -hmm. seems to be completely still, especially when it's still, when yeah. it's still there. But there's a lot of very, if you start to kind of zoom in on it, zoom in on the tree when you're looking at what composes the tree you will find that what composes its duration is its movements it's it's composite mm -hmm. of infinitesimal and imperceptible movements it's not that it's mm -hmm. not moving it's just that the speed of the tree is a lot slower relative to the speed of a race car, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you can easily perceive the speed of a car whenever it's going on the highway because, I mean, for one, there's a spatialized metaphor which we can kind of get away from, but at the same time, like it's it's easy to kind of tell how that how there's a speed to something that you can tell is moving and that doesn't seem to be static. But what Bergson wants us to kind of see is that there is a speed and movement of something that is, seems to be static because of its kind of infinitesimal and imperceptible elements. Um, I want to kind of end the recording here if that's okay. Um, but mm -hmm. is that is that cool with y'all? Yeah, Fantastic. cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This is great. Sweet. <laughs> um, I'm gonna end the recording now. Just confirm.